Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today is another lore video digging deep into the histories of the Wheel of Time. And I'll be looking at one of the cautionary tales of Tarvalan, the background of Bonwin, Meragden, the Amerlin who was deposed, stilled and kept as a kitchen maid, and the events that led up to it. As per usual, if you enjoy these types of videos, let me know by liking this one and subscribe to the channel. So let's begin. Dating back hundreds of years, the blue and red Ajas have had a fierce rivalry, but no other Aja has had more deposed Amerlins than those of the former red Aja. When we talk about the word deposed, we mean an Amerlin who is stripped of the shawl, taking away their position of leadership in a vote and stilled, which is the most severe punishment within the White Tower, because in almost all cases, stilling is a death sentence. When a deposition takes place, it usually begins with wrongdoing. An Aes Sedai, usually a sitter, needs to bring forth evidence of the wrongdoings, whether it be a failure to handle a political situation or just general incompetence. The arrival of the decision must require a general consensus within the tower. To depose the Amerlin, they need a majority vote. In the case of Bonwin, we have to look at multiple factors that led to her deposition. The first one being the setting and the political climate of the time, the war in the aftermath of the Second Dragon, and the War of Consolidation under Arthur Hawkwing. The next factors are the other parties that are involved in the events, which include the Aes Sedai and two men, Guyer Amalassan and Arthur Hawkwing. The War of the Second Dragon took place from 939 to 943, the Free Years, wreaking havoc on the majority of the Westlands, and was composed mainly of two factions, Tarvalin and its many allied kingdoms, and the kingdoms that rallied behind or were conquered by the self-proclaimed dragon of the time, Amalasan. Bonwin Maragden was born in 738 the Free Years, making her roughly 200 years old at the time of the conflict, and became the Amerlin the same year Amalasan declared himself the dragon. Now, Amalasan, the self-proclaimed dragon, was born with the ability to channel, with no royal lineage and only a dream of greatness. He raised a banner taking the Aes Sedai symbol, which I can imagine didn't please Tarvalin, and began to amass an army he called the Children of the Dragon. He was charismatic, and soon within a half of a year's time of proclaiming himself, he took the nation of Balasun and Elan Dapur near modern-day Terabon, naming himself ruler and proving to the world that not only was he a capable leader, but an incredible military captain of the time. During the next few years, thousands of followers joined him under his banner. During one of the most interesting battles in the prehistory of the Wheel of Time, Amalasan became one of the only people to almost achieve taking the Stone of Tyr. He held a massive siege on the stone, but coincidentally, 30 Aes Sedai had sought refuge within its walls when the city itself fell, defending it from Amalasan's army. Small tangent incoming, but if I were to write a script for a series taking place during the Wheel of Time, this is one event I would love to see play out. An entire army coming this close to taking the most defensive fortress in the landscape in a fierce battle against a very small squadron of Aes Sedai. It's just a cool setting. Anyways, by the year of 941, the world had seen the power of Amalasan, and each nation sent forth an army against him after witnessing the speed of his conquests. Shandal, or modern-day Kyrian, was a small nation, but was led by now King Arthur Hawkwing, and to the dismay of the larger armies, consistently put up an even match against Amalasan. Hawkwing never lost a battle, and in the worst case scenario, suffered a couple of stalemates, and thus became what history would call the War of the Second Dragon. In the decisive battle ending the war, the armies of Amalasan and Arthur Hawkwing caught each other unaware in Tova, or east of current-day Tarvalin. 
Hawkwing had roughly 23,000 foot soldiers and 12,000 cavalrymen and a number of Aes Sedai, met with Amalasan's army of 41,000 foot soldiers and 26 cavalrymen. The terrain was heavily forested with rugged hills, limiting the use of cavalry, so Amalasan had his men dismount, using them on foot, and the battle leaned heavily in his favor. Both sides lost many lives. The Aes Sedai joining Hawkwing could barely match Amalasan in sheer strength of the One Power. By the time the sun had set and the dark had come, Hawkwing had just made it out by the skin of his teeth, barely holding his army together. The fact that his men still followed him was a testament to their allegiance, and most likely due to Arthur Hawkwing's Tavir nature, a force of the pattern so strong that the likes of it would never be seen again until Rand Althor. But instead of fleeing in darkness, Arthur Hawkwing feigned a retreat and moved his rearguard in position to protect the fleeing army, obscuring the movements to Amalasan's scouts. He then divided his dwindling troops. Only a madman would attempt to flank at night on a disastrous terrain, but that's exactly what Arthur Hawkwing did. When the sun rose, he struck from the east and the west, and his cavalry charged from the south after completing a 50-mile trek at night, taking Amalasan by surprise and capturing him, and putting a swift end to the rise of his followers. Now, despite his Tavira nature usually swinging in terms of his favor, Hawkwing did something some would argue incredibly bold, laughably stupid, or just plain bad advice, taking his entire army north to Tarvalin. By law, no army is permitted to enter the city of the Aes Sedai, leaving only one exception for 40 retainers, permitting only half of them to be armed. One school of thought believes Hawkwing received permission to move on the city by the Aes Sedai fighting in his army, but the world will never know what exactly led him to do so. Some say he was defiant, while others say his Aes Sedai requested an escort. But upon reaching the border of the city, the hero Aes Sedai who shielded and delivered the false dragon Amalasan were forced to serve penance for allowing the army so close to the White Tower. After news spread, followers of Amalasan began taking up arms once again, intent on freeing their leader. One rumored to be a channeler and rogue Aes Sedai, named Elende Mothenios, an expert in siege warfare. As the false dragon awaited his trial and was sentenced to gentling, Hawkwing remained camped with his entire army. Elende, Mothenios, and an army of a hundred thousand struck the bridges leading to the city of Tarvalin before being held off by Arthur Hawkwing. And this is where the reports become even more jumbled and the history books differ. Some believe the White Tower invited Hawkwing and asked him to bring his army within the city to defend it. But all of the White Tower sources leave out the fact that his army actually entered the city. In the end, the assailants were defeated and Elende the rogue Aes Sedai was killed, but Amerlin Bonewin and Arthur Hawkwing departed on bad terms. This event marks a disastrous public relations event for Tarvalin, who in most times want to be seen as self-sufficient and capable of defending themselves alone. Anything else is a sign of weakness. Arthur Hawkwing returns home a victor and crowned High King, but it is said the Amerlin Bonewin never forgave Hawkwing for entering the city. In 943 The Free Years, Bonewin was even snubbed by a group of royals who refused an audience with the Amerlin, another slight and embarrassment for Tarvalin. In the years following 943, another war takes place, called the War of Consolidation. Bonewin desperately urged several kingdoms to attack Shandell, Arthur Hawkwing's home, and despite being held to defensive battles, Hawkwing's luck continued with him, winning and ending up in control of a large portion of the continent, unified now as a single empire. In 936, Arthur Hawkwing was declared the High King of the Westlands. For a few years, things were relatively peaceful, and the empire under Hawkwing had found something of a new era. The lands became safer and easier to travel, 
New cities rose with public works taking the forefront. Hawkwing even allows the Aes Sedai under Bonewin to hold office as governors and advisors meddling in politics. But when the world is at peace, the shadow tends to strategize a new attack, and what comes next shouldn't come to a surprise to anyone. In 973, a man named Jalwin Morad appears in Hawkwing's court and soon becomes his most trusted advisor. This is, of course, hinted to be none other than the Forsaken known as Ishamayel under an alias. In true fashion, he sows chaos, wrecking all that which Hawkwing has built, and he advises Hawkwing to dismiss all the Aes Sedai from his service, and lastly, to lay a siege on the city of the Aes Sedai. In 975 of the Free Years, his armies overrun the territory of Tarvalin and lay siege to the city. Then in 992, Bonewin is deposed, stripped of the shawl, and removed as Omerlin for trying to keep the greatest Taviran the world had ever seen, Arthur Hawkwing, on a leash. So little information of this event remains, but what's really important to understand is that the Omerlin, despite being one of the highest authorities in this world, is never safe. She must always hold a majority within the tower, otherwise she is in danger of meddlers and Machiavellian plots. History tells us Bonewin fell victim to her own hubris, holding a grudge against Arthur Hawkwing, then sending out advisors to keep him as a puppet. It is unlikely that the White Tower ever learned that Ashamayel took credit for seizing power within Hawkwing's court and causing chaos between the relationship between Tarvalin and the rest of the Empire. But this is the advantage of the Shadow. Infiltrate, cause chaos, retreat, and repeat. Anytime we see a war or hostile takeover happen within the landscape of Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time, one should always question whether or not the Dark One has had a hand at play. With the deposition and stilling of Bonewin, a new Omerlin of the former Blue Aja was then raised to take her place, reigniting the Blue versus Red Aja feud that still remains thousands of years later up to the time of Swan Sanche. Bonewin Maragdan was kept as a scullion until she died four years after her stilling at the age of 258. Her story remains an example to new novices in the tower and a good source of information for anyone curious about how deposition works. It's a cautionary tale of why trying to control a Taviran is such a risk and why the Omerlin must always hold majority control of the tower. It also leads to the idea that no position of power is truly safe and always an invitation for the forces of the dark to infiltrate. That wraps things up. Thanks for watching and I'll see you back next time.